Ahora me veis también. Welcome, oh, welcome everybody to the uh, to a new session of the Monday uh, online seminar of IFT. Today we are very happy to have with us Diego Blas from King's College, who is going to uh, to give a standing uh, standing lecture on yes. how to uh, search for like that matter using atomic clocks and magnetometers. So please. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I hope everyone is uh, safe and healthy and that uh, I can go to Madrid soon to talk about this or other matters. Indeed, I was supposed to be there last week. So it's a pity that the, this workshop didn't happen. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to it when it finally can happen. All right, so this is going to be a, a talk on an exploration that we started uh, some time ago with Rodrigo Alonso that uh, you know well, so because he's one of the people who studied in uh, EFT. Uh, Peter Wolf, who is an uh, atomic clock expert on the theory part of it. Um, the uh, original question was relatively simple. Uh, the question was, what happens with the most precise devices on Earth when you uh, consider the fact that they don't live in vacuum? but they live in a sea of cosmic relics, right? So you, you, that was the, the question, basically. And uh, I had this question for many years. And finally, when I met Rodrigo and we talked to Peter, we managed to, to find a satisfactory answer. So we are going to see how the fact that there is dark matter in the universe uh, affects the way atomic clocks work. Eventually, can, we, can we interrupt you, Diego? So yes, yes. Uh, other cosmic relics, of course, are neutrinos and photons. I guess yeah, you're not yeah. interested them. Yeah, well, with photons, in principle, you can, uh, I, I mean, you, uh, well, you depending on the them. energy, you can screen them. For yeah. neutrinos, neutrinos, unfortunately, we are not sensitive enough. We, I, I will say something about this at the end. Okay. Or gravitational waves also, right? In uh -huh, principle, that's right. you could also try to look for gravitational waves. So they... The difference with dark matter is that there are so many models of dark matter that typically you always find the model you want for the particular uh, you know, way to look for it. So in this case, light dark matter is the kind of candidate that is going to be ideal for, for these searches. But of course, we also thought about neutrinos and there are some prospects. Also, we, our original question was about atomic clocks. But then we, we realized by talking to, by giving a, a, you know, some talks and talking to people that co-magnetometers are in fact more sensitive to the particular uh, uh, um, event that atomic clocks in this talk are gonna be also sensitive to, all right? Uh, well, uh, I'm not a dark matter person. So uh, in principle, I had to learn a lot for this project. And I really think that we, we made a, a I mean, we made a big effort for our JH paper to summarize this knowledge so that basically everyone can go and understand in detail how this happens. So I invite you to really have a look at this paper. This one is more about the atomic clock physics and it's a bit more technical. So for dark matter evidence, I don't want to, to spend more, a lot of time. So this is supposed to be uh the only slide i have so there is uh, evidence for the existence of dark matter coming from very different length scales like from rotation curves at some kiloparsecs right to basically the whole universe right and dark matter is present at different time scales and at different length scales and there is so much evidence in this different uh, landscape that one if one is not from this field one could imagine that you know all this evidence is enough to point towards a single candidate, right? or at, at least some families of candidates for dark matter. So that's the first question. That again, if you think about dark matter, I mean, and see all the evidence, you may ask yourself: Is this all this evidence from you know galactic curves, um, microwave background, clusters, collision of clusters, structure formation? Is it enough? To select a dark matter candidate, or at least how how well we know dark matter from all this evidence. And here I just put the cosmic pie um, in the dark matter sector, which is, as you know, quite uh, 
um, more abundant than the baryonic uh, matter sector, there can happen, two things can happen. Also, one, one thing that can happen is that it is a can relatively boring sector where there is a single candidate or another thing that can happen is that it is closer to what happens in the baryonic sector that there are different uh, constituents, there are different interactions, and there is some uh, richness in this sector, right? That, uh, you know, you want to finally um, find in the different observations. So to address this question, so how do we, what do we know about dark matter? Let me uh, take a step back and start a very simple uh, shopping list of what do we want from our dark matter candidate. So I, I call this boundaries of the dark matter landscape. Uh, yes, that's uh, kind of a random title. So this candidate for sure should become a cold relic at late time. So it should behave as a self-gravitating medium at a particular redshift and start generating a structure, uh, the, um, the halos that we, we, we love and, and observe. It also requires, the kind of candidate requires some production mechanism in the early universe. And not only a mechanism, but also a cosmology that is viable, right? So there are these two things that are compulsory. These two um, points are not very constraining, right? So in principle, there are many, many candidates that satisfy these two um, requirements. So the next thing one can try to ask is, all right, so I'm going to be happier if this dark matter uh, candidate has some motivation from fundamental physics. So how much does it buy in this landscape? As you know, it doesn't buy too much. And that's kind of a... I think shocking the first time you, you see it, is that even if you consider particle dark matter, so I'm not gonna discuss in this talk anything about black holes or other compact objects uh, proposals for dark matter, even if you only restrict yourself to a particle dark matter, there are models spanning uh, a huge amount of orders of magnitude in mass, right? And also with all possible spins, uh, for what the mass of this uh, dark matter candidate is. And um, different models are motivated by different fundamental physics, like WIMP candidates, right? They were and are still very popular. They have to do with electroweak scale, SUSI, or any other mechanism that has to do with this scale. They select a particular scale uh, in the mass, but you can go higher with other models or more, for, more important for this talk, you can go to way, way, way lighter candidates. And there is another benchmark in this, uh, in this regime of masses, the QCD action, where 10 to the minus 6 electron volts is a favorite mass. But also you can go to much, much lighter candidates and even to candidates of 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 22 electron volts that are well motivated through a string theory. OK, so it doesn't look very promising to just try to constrain dark matter with these three points. Now, what is the other part of the, if you want dark matter miracle, okay, that allows us to constrain the kind of models that we like. So the fourth point, not so, if you want so fundamental, but also very interesting, is the possibility of testing this dark matter in the lab or through um, indirect astrophysical observations, right? Not only through the gravitational effects, but also through some kind of decays or uh, scatterings in the in the universe so to before I, I move to this kind of um, possibilities let me tell you that all these candidates i'm going to talk about share some knowns so we there is a lot we don't know about their matter there are a few facts that in principle these models share as i said i'm not going to discuss uh, uh, other candidates with compact objects with where some of these numbers may, may be different, but for the candidates that I'm, I'm discussing in this talk, there is a, in the galaxy a, a structure of dark matter that encompasses the disk structure, right? And this is the dark matter halo. This dark matter halo cannot be anything. It has to have some sphericity, so it cannot be a disk, right? Otherwise the rotation curves don't, don't match. So this already tells you that dark matter cannot be very dissipative, right? 
it has in principle to produce a uh, energy density in the solar neighborhood of 0.3 GB per centimeter cube. Okay, okay. Uh, again, this is a vanilla expectation. And in principle, our sun rotates, uh, as it rotates in its travel through the galaxy, it uh, is rotating with a mean velocity of 10 to the minus three, the speed of light, uh, with respect to this uh, dark matter halo, which means that it has a typical momentum, these, these particles of the, if you start integrating many of these particles, the typical momentum that you're gonna find is given by this number, like mass of the dark matter particle, 10 to the minus three. And if you take these two numbers and compute the flux of particles going through a centimeter square per second, this number is what you find. So it's not very big for MeV particles. So you take this um, <clears throat> energy density, transform it into number density, and then take into account, which is a typical velocity. You see that for MeV particles, you have 10 to the 10 particles per centimeter square per second, not a big flux. But if you start considering masses, which are way, way smaller than MeV, you see that this flux becomes at some point macroscopic, right? So at some point you have a huge amount of particles or a huge amount of momentum as you go on, well, let's talk about particles going through your detector at, the, at, at this particular at, at this particular point. So can we ever be sensitive to this huge amount of particles? That's, that's the question I want to ask now. And that's the question that I started with at the beginning. So I have a huge, flux of particles, I have an atomic clock or whatever device which is super sensitive. So when and how do these particles um, interact with the clock or with any other device? So let me see, let me tell you what happens in the, what I call traditional data detection experiments. In these experiments, you have this dark matter particle going from the left of my screen and then there is some nucleus coming from the right or at rest if you want. They scatter and some energy of the um, dark matter particle is deposited into this process and generates a recoil of the nucleus, right? This is, uh, well, this is what happens if you have just scattering and how much energy you can extract from this event. Well, all you can extract, in mind that you can extract all the kinetic energy of the dark matter. The dark matter has uh, kinetic energy m v square and v is 10 to the minus three. So the maximum recoil of the, I mean, the maximum recoil energy for this nucleus is simply given by the mass you want by the kinetic energy of this, of this dark matter, which is the mass 10 to the minus three. So eventually if the mass is GV, right? The maximum energy that you can extract is around keV, right? Now you take a detector, a huge uh, volume with the very sensitive um, isotopes, right? And try to look for these records. And then you can produce one of these very beautiful and impressive plots of the cross section in the vertical axis versus the mass of the candidate. And what you see is that these, uh, these plots, they peak, oops, sorry. They peak at uh, some particular point. And then when you go to lower masses, because the recoil energy is not enough to, you know, to generate an event that you can, you can see, then there is a huge separation at low. So there is a low energy threshold that goes really, really up and destroys the sensitivity of these devices at low masses. Low masses is indeed no, I mean, it's, it's, it's just the same because these masses are very high for the landscape, for the landscape I showed you before. So every, anything below MeV, in the dark matter mass is really very hard to see in one of these huge detectors. But there are so many candidates below. So what do we do? Right? That's one of the, so remember, that then two points. Low masses means huge flux, but of course, small momentum. So what that means that in principle, you don't have enough momentum. So you have, a lot, you have to try to explore processes to detect this dark matter that happen all the time. So that don't require a huge momentum transfer. So that in, if you want, are sensitive to the whole amount of particles going through your device. This is a very active uh, field, right? Um, 
different people have proposed. I mean, I think there are more experiments than groups nowadays, which are proposed. So we, we have a, also our own proposal and our proposal is based on atomic clocks, right? And co-magnetometers. So for atomic clocks, uh, I'm gonna give you a summary of some of the achievements that uh, are very impressive of where do we stand today with these devices. And here is a plot. So there are uh, three, if you want to explore more about these devices, there are three reviews which are quite good. I, I recommend more for uh, our community this one where they really uh, have summarized the uses of different devices for BSM physics. So you want to learn more about these guys, this is a good place to look at. This review here is a review on optical clocks. So not so much about the particle physics, but you can learn more about how these devices work. So there are two main families of clocks. There are more, but I'm gonna discuss basically two, this blue line and this red line. So here in this plot, what you see on the vertical axis is the fractional uncertainty on, uh, um, on a, uh, the difference between two energy levels of uh, atomic state, right? So the difference in the energy, sorry, the measurement, right? The measurement in this transition as compared to the total transition, right? So uh, this fractional uncertainty. And as a function of time, for clocks which operate with microwave transitions, so that means with frequencies which are around gigahertz, a bit more like 10 gigahertz, like rubidium, cesium, and those have a very, very long tradition, and that's why they are uh, the standards of time, right? Because people understand very well all the systematics of, this, of these systems. Uh, they have been improving for many years in a steady uh, way, so nowadays, these rubidium cesium uh, clocks, they are at the level of, well, you can see it in this other plot, at 10 to of the relative uncertainty, 10 to the minus 16. Very impressive. What is more impressive, I, I say, is that the progress in optical clocks. So optical clocks operate with optical transitions. And here there are some examples, but well, also these ones, so basically around the EV. So quite more energetic transitions. And uh, well, there was some technical difficulties to start making these clocks, but at some point, these difficulties were beaten and the progress in these clocks had been really, really fast, had been faster and the future is more promising for these clocks than for the cesium clocks or for the microwave clocks. Still, uh, I believe that the, the standards for time are given by rubidium cesium. And the reason I think is really because the community requires some time to adapt to the new systematics. But it, from this plot, it's kind of obvious that the future of standards, of time standards, uh, well, unless there is some breakthrough in the microwave, clocks is gonna come from uh, optical clocks. For this talk, and uh, for what I'm gonna discuss, it turns out that it's, it, it's more important the rubidium and fission clocks are gonna be more important. And the reason is gonna be, I will tell you again later, but the reason is that we are not gonna be interested in the relative uh, uncertainty, but in the total delta. Right? And at the same amount of uh, fractional uncertainty, the clocks with the smallest energy, they are able to measure the, the most precise difference in the energy levels. Right. Hey, Diego, sorry, quick question. Yes. So, uh, do you know if in the future is there any uh, limit that can be reached with atomic clocks? Is there some fundamental the lesson from physics or something yes, that can yes. limit the precision? The limit, the limit of the precision is, is given by short noise, if you want. The, the amount of right. atoms that you, can, <laughs> that you can place for one second in these fountains and operational. Nowadays, these guys uh, have 10 to the 6 atoms. And that, if you want, the, this precision here, you can really attribute all of it to the number of atoms in the in the device. If you manage to start yeah. making clocks which are which have more atoms, then this is gonna this this will improve. 
So seeing this plot, it seems that uh, it's following something like a Moore's law. So the precision keeps improving exponentially. So do you know if you have read somewhere when this limit will be reached? I mean, like 10, 20, no. 30 years or? Mm, not really. So the, the idea is if you manage to do a, a yeah, it has to do with the with how do you improve in quantum technologies as you want. So you manage to do a, a system with 10 to the 20 atoms that is stay coherent for one second, <laughs> then you beat it, right? But then what you can do nowadays is 10 to the six, 10 to the seven atoms coherent for one second. That's okay. what you can achieve. You can also play tricks because the well, other another there are other ways to beat quantum uncertainties and it's by deforming phase space right like you do in lisa in ligo sorry mm -hmm. so in principle if you just start entangled atoms and do some kind of ma magic there people believe that you can do better but that's all i know okay thanks but it's really it, it, what you are seeing in this plot at least for these clocks is really amount of atoms so you manage to trap uh, more atoms you have to cool them down uh cool i mean and then make them as, as i said uh, stable for one second and this is very challenging technology sorry, sorry can you repeat what is the the difference your comparison with lisa interferometry no no well no in, in ligo sorry in, in ligo oh. in ligo also the, the the laser that they shoot to the to the mirrors they they well they want to use some lasers that can beat uh, quantum quantum noise by the forming phase space so you can never beat uncertainty the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but you can deform the, you can you can squeeze it as you want. You can use squeeze states. That's what I want. So in principle, there are ideas of how to use squeeze or, or entangle states for these atomic clocks. But as you may imagine, I don't know much about it. <laughs> I know they can improve sensitivity. Or in other words, here you assume that the states of the atoms are in the you know in a gas or free atoms but that's all you want you don't they are not entangled or in any particular uh, um, state sorry can you clarify do you mean that these atoms tend to the six already is a big number are they in a kind of a bossy no they are not that, that's what not? i'm saying they are not they're not, not in a condensate that, that way so would you improve if you were uh, you yes. put those atoms into a condensate so that that 20, obviously you cannot attain otherwise that what I'm saying that in principle, this is a. I think people are exploring this kind of things. I see. Entangle them or entangle them a bit. Um, I can only tell you this kind of uh, logic. Uh, I, I don't know more at this point about it. But this is an interesting point also for for all these searches of dark matter, whether you can improve in these directions. For me, it's also going to be important if you can improve even with the same number of atoms, but denser. Those are not very dense. If you make them denser, uh, I can explain you later on why, why this is important, but if you make them denser, you may be able to, to, to reach more sensitivity. All right. Okay, so now how are we gonna use these devices? All right, uh, here again, we were very lucky that Weinberg decided to include in his uh, book on quantum mechanics, a section on the basic operation of these atomic clocks, right? And I really uh, advise you to, to go and have a look because it's, it's, you know, it's explained very well and everything is everything that I'm gonna use in the next two slides is, is, in, is found in this section. So let me give you a rush, uh, well, not course, but a couple of slides on how these uh, atomic clocks operate. So we, we start, we're going to start with a, an atom and in, or a 10 to the 6 atoms, okay, and all of them are in a particular atomic state, right, which is uh, it's characterized by some hyperfine sp splitting level. So there is a total, you want total angular momentum and the total azimuthal angular momentum here. Now, you shine some light, okay, to it by doing a small amount of time. This is the, the frequency of the light is close to the frequency of the hyper fine splitting, right? What you can do is that by shining light during some time, <coughs> T1, you generate a superposition of two states, one and two, 
and they differ by the total angular momentum, right? And this is basically because they are absorbing photons that you want. So you can, there is this photon field here, and you just do a, you want, it's a classical field, so you put this atom in an, with two different levels in a classical field, and then, well, this is, a, again, it's not only Weimer who does this, right? <coughs> it's a classical calculation that you generate a superposition. Now you let this live for a long time t, <clears throat> and after this long time t, capital T, you shine again this, this microwave, in this case, a light, for the same amount of time as at the beginning, and after this time, you measure the probability of state two and the probability of state one. Remember that you started with P1 equal one, P2 equals zero. Now, you can make this calculation. Uh, it, in principle, it depends on the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave. It depends on T1, on T, it depends on different parameters. But these parameters can be tuned or adjusted such that uh, in the good, in the human, in the appropriate configuration of the device, the probability of having state number two here is given by the cosinus delta omega, where delta omega is the frequency of the light minus the frequency of the transition, right? And then this big time. What happens now is that you have built a device that by adjusting <clears throat> the frequency of the light, you can simply look for when this is maximum. And when this is maximum, you know that this frequency, so this is zero, so you know that this frequency omega of the maximum is identical to the difference of the energy of these states. Here the magic happens if you want in the middle. So you have to compute this for a generic configuration, but then it's not difficult for the experimentalist to adjust these numbers to finally produce this P2. And once you have produced this P2, so the probability of number two, you start measuring, measuring it. And there is a kind of feedback process to find the maximum of omega. And when you find it, you know that this is locked, it's called locked to the transition, right? As I said, the, that, that's the way these things work. So what you, you are really measuring, if you want, is the difference in the energy, if you want the difference in the phase of these two states that have been traveling during this big time. Is this, this is what happens in our theory's mind, but if you are in the lab, of course the, these atoms, they don't live alone, but there is some background. In the case of atomic clocks, these backgrounds are, you know, extra atoms that are there because you are not in perfect vacuum. In the case of, uh, for the purpose of this talk, this background is gonna be a cosmic relic, right? That is going through your lab. And since the main time is this big time, I mean, we, we, you can't forget what happens in, this two, in these two events and just take into account what happens during the big time T where these states are living freely, all right? And each of it, in principle evolves according to simply e to the i energy t all right you can imagine you can already think that whatever happens the energy levels so whatever if there is an extra interaction given by this background which is coherent and changes the energy of one and two right by this process of, of the atomic clocks you are going to be able to precisely detect it so if that matter or any other background changes this, um, the splitting of these levels, right? You may be able to detect it. This, if you want, is similar to the MSW on the, on the clock frame. Now you go to the frame of, of, the, of the clock and you are traveling through a background of that matter, then if you interact, you may be interacting, right? In a way which is state dependent and eventually, you know, the same, the same kind of calculations that you do for the MSW, but in this case for that matter, may provide or may generate a energy splitting. The natural question now is, can you compute the free part of it to the level that you are sensitive to, I mean, you are able to detect any difference which come, is coming from BSM? The answer is no. So the, the resolution that you have in atomic clocks 
is something that you measure. You cannot compute it. So you must make sure that this new, uh, these new effects are somehow modulated or there are some fluxes associated to it that you can control, right? So this is gonna be important later on. But for the moment, let's just take one single particle of dark matter. This single particle scatters a state which is a superposition of two, one and two, right? And then leaves the apparatus. And when it leaves the apparatus, the wave function is modified by acquiring, right, the typical scattering part of it, right? So this is the, you can do indeed, since the, I'm gonna consider only the, the case where the mass of the dark matter each is much, much lighter than the mass of the atom, I can just do a scattering in a central uh, potential, sorry, in a, um, yeah, in a fixed potential, right? And use the standard scattering formula. So what we did in, in, this, in this paper is to compute, well, given a scattering event, what happens to the probability of two, right? When you fix the device to the standard um, setup. And what you find is that the probability of having two is given by the standard result, of course, and doing perturbations in the interactions. The first, the first modification is also proportional to the delta omega, now with a sinus, is proportional to what I told you before, to the difference between the interaction of with the state one and a state two. And since we have done this calculation with a single wave packet, it has also some, um, it depends on the wave packet size, which is given by this number, and on the momentum of the particle coming in and coming out. Quite remarkable, and that's very important, is that the uh, matrix element that you have to put here, so the scattering uh, element that you have to put here, is the one corresponding to zero momentum transfer. So this event, if you want, is maximized. If you eat the dark matter, simply goes through the atom and does nothing to it as long as it is the same as happens in any matter effects with the, when you have coherent, coherent scattering, sorry, that the zero momentum transfer is, is relevant. So that's why these kind of devices are gonna be but, um, interesting for us. Yeah, why do you have I, this? Yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> um, this motion of dark matter has to be coherent in order to leave an effect. Otherwise, it's like thermal motion, right? Absolutely. So absolutely. they would just move in all directions and the effect would disappear. Correct. That correct? That, so you're assuming that all dark matter particles go across your device, all with the same momentum, same direction, everything. Well, for the moment, I did only one, right? So for the moment, I have only yeah, one I'm particle. I'm imagining what you're going to do And now, next. the next is precisely yeah. do the flux. Okay. So the, before telling you this, now, how do I detect dark matter? Well, I compute. I, I do the same thing as before. So I maximize P2, and now the maximum of P2 is delta E plus some new effect, right? And that's where dark matter is gonna appear. Right. But indeed, there is a flux of particles. And here, as uh, Juan was saying, well, the, let me tell you first that the, uh, as usual, the um, dependence on the wave packet disappears because now I have a flux, very good. So this is more physical, but I also need to average over interactions, right? So if, when am I gonna be able to, uh, someone has the mic on, sorry. <laughs> when I'm gonna be able to, to detect anything is when, uh, when these two numbers are different. So when my scattering differentiates between state one and two, states one and two, they have different total angular momentum. So that's important for the rest. And also when the average of this cross of this, uh, sorry, when the average of this uh, event doesn't average to zero. It can happen that this is a, for instance, velocity dependent interaction. So if I take all the events that go, go through it, through, the, through this uh, lab uh, atomic clock, if there is a preferred direction, then there will be some uh, non-averaging non out of this preferred momentum in these quantities. Or also, even if they average out, they will leave some signal as a noise, as you were saying also. So in principle, I can also try to look for, uh, if I have N events, right? I can try to look for a square, a square root of N in the noise of the detector. So these two things are different. Of course, one of them is more, 
uh, you want is more constraining. If all the if there is a net flux that doesn't average out, that's more constraining. But still, these devices are so precise that for some models, also the, as you say, the random noise that you generate in this splitting may also be relevant. Now, how do we compute these two guys? Well, this is something that is more familiar for people who do dark matter phenomenology. So what you have to do is you have to compute some uh, scattering processes. For us, since we are in a, a non-relativistic regime and we only care about this uh, three level, it, we can use the simplest possible formulas and is that this matrix element here, well, the scattering um, F is connected to the S matrix T, okay, these, these two just definitions. And uh, all this just comes in the Born approximation with a, the value, I mean, it does, amounts to evaluating this matrix element. So there is an interaction between the dark matter and the atom, so the electrons or the quarks, right? And you have to evaluate this matrix element. And uh, whatever you find, then you evaluate it at zero momentum transfer, and that's it. Here there is a difficulty if you are not in the field, uh, which is that well, the dark matter is relatively easy for what the wave packet is, a uh, free particle. But for the atom, you have to start understanding a bit what is this atom. So you have to uh, specify whatever it's, uh, atom you have in your uh, clock. So for us, rubidium with F and lambda is given by a nucleus, uh, an, an electron in the 5S orbital. And since I am discussing the eigenstate of total angular momentum, so there is going to be some Clash Gordons here, right? That I had used for the last time. 10 years, no, I don't know, 15 years ago. <laughs> but it was very good to, to go back to those clutch cordons. Uh, right, so you have to plug this back here. As I said, for the dark matter, this is simple. And now, what do we consider for interactions? So which kind of Lagrangians of interactions, which kind of potentials are going to be those that we uh, can measure? So remember that we need that the amplitude for F and for F plus 1, so these two states are different. These two states are differentiated by the total spin of the matter components. So when I consider an effective interaction between matter and dark matter, I'm going to be able to say something about those couplings that you know differentiate between the spin of the electrons or the spin of the quarks. Right? So this way, when I have, let's say, this kind of interaction here, no? the, the spin of the electron, when I compute the <coughs> sorry. I compute the um, this matrix element here when there is this kind of interaction uh, between matter and dark matter. Then what I find is that the difference between these two uh, these two matrix elements sorry is not going to be seen. Otherwise, sorry, I don't know if oh this is clear. I cannot by this. By, by this kind of setups, I can only differentiate between states that have different matrix elements. And in the, in the particular case of state one and two in the microwave uh, atoms, these two are differentiated by the spin. So I'm going to be able to differentiate a spin dependent interactions. Once you do the calculation, so we did this calculation and the difference between these two states, one and two, for the rubidium atom given a fundamental coupling to the electrons or to the nucleons. So here there is some form factors that are not very important. They are typically order one. The important thing is that the kind of coupling to the nucleon spin, or the kind of coupling to the electron spin generates a total effect. So this is you want is the difference between the amplitude for state F and F plus one. And is this fundamental coupling multiplied by the azimuthal spin so it has to be a polarized sample oh sorry and here that's is where uh, we cannot put anything also for the dark matter current because this is going to be a spin um, current so whatever this couples to it can only be the the current of the dark matter in the velocity or the spin yeah in other words i can couple the spin of dark matter to a spin of matter or velocity of dark matter to spin of matter 
and this kind of couplings are going to generate a different amplitudes that I may be able to see in the in the clocks. This comes from the effective theory that I wrote before. You can also scatter something in between. So, if, for instance, you have this kind of uh, uh, interaction between a axial vector and some electrons in the atom. So the electron scatters, right? Uh, with this uh, dark matter, in this case, uh, axial vector. And you can see that in this, in this case, this, um, these two matrix elements are also, you know, uh, different. And the difference comes from the spin of the electron, oh, sorry, of the atom here, and the polarization of the <coughs> axial vector. For uh, pseudo-scalars, unfortunately, this doesn't work. For pseudo-scalars, it work. I mean, of course, you can compute this this process, but the, in the zero momentum transfer, because there is a derivative in the vertex, this goes to zero. So axions cannot be very well constrained by these guys. So this is a recap, right? So uh, and if it's, I said I, there is something which is not clear, please interrupt me here when I finish, please. So there is, this is the goal, I mean, the most important quantity you want to compute, the average of the zero momentum transfer of these two matrix elements. You can use Born rule, no problem. So these are gonna be non-zero for this kind of coupling, like uh, electron spin, velocity of dark matter, electron spin, velocity, uh, sorry, spin of dark matter, and so on and so forth. Now, coming back to the question by Juan, this is for a single dark matter, a process, but now you have to average these currents, the dark matter currents, and Be, before that, before that, can yes. you go to the previous slide? Yeah. Why the first line goes proportional to the mass of the M sub k of the candidate, or if you go to the previous one, you know what I'm asking? Are the interactions there that you call gamma i? Um, they are all vector or axial vector. What I'm, I'm trying to track where the mass dependence comes from. Yeah, in this case. So what mm, is this gamma that you put in the previous? What here? Time? Give me examples, yes. This one here. Ah, it's down there. I was not seeing before. The yeah, part sorry, sorry. The spin the, one. I was the down part. Okay, <laughs> so then it makes sense. Yes. Yeah, okay, fine, fine. I'm Thank happy. <laughs> Good. Thanks. You, I, I will, in principle, uh, in principle, you can also try to look for uh, vector interactions, that's fine. But then you need to use two states which have very different momentum, if you know what I mean. Because in principle then, the F1 minus F2, so if, if a state number one and a state number two, they have very different momentum, then momentum dependent interactions may also be uh, seen by this, by these kind of setups. But for these atoms that, sorry, for these uh, atomic clocks that I'm using, the main difference between one and two is the spin. Yeah, but That's in that case, that you have a scalar go back one interaction, yeah. go back one slide there. Yeah. Uh, then for this to make sense, because you are putting like a contact interaction, so you are yeah. assuming a higher scale somewhere, blah, blah, yes. blah. So then the whole thing, the, the coupling, these couplings that you call there, G sub B super I and G sub Q super yes. I, they would have to be proportional to the mass of the fermion. Yeah, that's true. Hmm? That's because true. otherwise it doesn't make sense for each invariance. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Thank okay. you. So for the average effect, uh, as I said, uh, well, what we discussed, either this is cast, this eventually averages to some coherent part, like when you think about this, 10 to the minus three, uh, which is this uh, average velocity of our atoms as compared to the dark matter uh, particles or uh, generate a kind of noise. So if dark matter is not polarized, uh, and I don't think there are, I, I don't know if there is any model with polarized dark matter, uh, I didn't find any. So then all these, each of these events for each particular atom is, has a random phase difference. So the total phase difference eventually averages up to zero, but this averaging is controlled by square root of n, so if you compute which is the number of total uh, events, you can indeed know if you have had this amount of events just by looking at the noise. I don't know, I guess this is kind of clear. That's why, for instance, it's, it's better to have something more compact, like if you have the same device but more compact, 
then the, 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 uh, the atoms in the device are going to see the same particles more often. And the kind of precision that you have for this, uh, for this kind of events is going to be higher. Anyways, you, you want to put some numbers. Uh, the typical numbers of atomic clocks are 10 to the 6 atoms in centimeters. And the process lasts like one second. Finally, how do we measure it? As I told you, we cannot measure it directly. Uh, we cannot compute these uh, super small differences in the energy. So what you have to do is to find some modulation or something. Indeed, this is a modulated effect because the spin of the sample here is chosen always in the same direction. Let's say, I don't know, if you are in the equator, imagine that, well, not in the equator. Yeah, in the equator is the best, yeah. In the equator and it is going up orthogonal to the surface of the earth as you rotate, right? This rotates. In principle, the current of that matter may be coherent during the whole day. And eventually, you're going to see that this is a modulated effect with a period of modulation one day. So it's something that you can look in your data. Now, why I told you before that atomic clocks with um, these uh, low energy transitions are better? Well, because if you have the same relative precision, right? This is the same, let's say 10 to the minus 16, the 10 to the minus 15, the absolute precision. So the, the, remember that the matter changes the absolute difference in the energy. And if the transition is of lower energy, then this is a more, more stringent bound. So for this kind of uh, phenomenology, it's better to go to this rubidium clocks. And indeed, the, if you put numbers in, the, the difference in the energy that you are actually detecting doesn't look so impressive right but you know it's impressive that you can do it for so many atoms is the for the difference in the energy for each atom is 10 to the minus 5 hertz and now you can ask yourself so we were very happy with this result but we, you can also ask yourself is this the best way to detect absolute energy difference we know that atomic clocks are the best to detect relative energy difference but for absolute energy difference indeed they are not always the case and that's where uh, this magnetometer comes in. The magnetometer has a huge amount of atoms, 10 to the 22, so Avogadro, almost. Uh, they, are, they are devices which are able to measure this kind of interaction. Right? So there is some constant, there is some magnetic field, and there is some spin. And this magnetic field is what you want to measure. How do you do it? Well, you polarize a sample. So there is a, here you polarize this. 10 to the 22 atoms in a certain direction. Then this generates a split of energy, right? Uh, when you compare the, the spin up and the spin down with respect to this the direction, and because of this energy difference generated by the magnetic field, this polarized sample is going to precess, and you detect this precession with different techniques, right? But eventually, what you are what you are measuring is an energy difference. And now you may have the same logic as before. These atoms don't live alone in the universe. There is a background. There are particles colliding with this superposition of states. And you can compute that the difference in the frequency of precession in this Larmor frequency is indeed now given by the same formula that you had before, because these two guys are different. I mean, the difference is also spin, right? And these guys, these common atomometers, can compete with atomic clocks because they have way, way more atoms. So in principle, the, the total phase difference that you can measure with these devices is better. There is a tricky part that you don't know what is this magnetic field. So in principle, if you turn on a common atomometer, this uh, may be, the effect of the dark matter may be totally suppressed by the fact that you don't know what the magnetic field is. But that's why you need to use co-magnetometers and indeed uh, separate, you know, uh, with one of them, you can, if you want, measure the magnetic field, and with the other one, you measure the part coming from the dark matter in the, in the device. And when you translate the numbers that they can measure, which is femtoteslas, to the, to the uh, energy levels of these two states, you see that the number is way 
better than what I had before. Before I had that the energy levels, sorry, the energy difference that you measure in the in the um, atomic clock is this one, whereas the one that you measure for magnetometers is is better. All right, so uh, before moving to some plots, I'm gonna discuss a bit of the ultralight dark matter regime. All I told you so far happens because there are particles, so particles of dark matter scattering with my detector or with my atomic clock. And the kind of uh, formalism is similar to the one you have in particle physics. There are candidates for dark matter in the ultralight regime where new phenomena appear. So let me very briefly tell you that, well, this is a slide that uh, I guess some of you have seen before, that dark matter at ultralight uh, masses behaves as cold dark matter. Okay, that's, uh, well, here you can see a simulation of 30 megaparsec size of the dark matter over densities for the case where you treat dark matter with ultralight masses or with standard wave masses and you see that the structure is very similar but I, I, I think I'm running out of time so I'm, I'm going to jump to to the um, to this next slide which is that what happens when you have ultralight dark matter in a galaxy it is better to describe dark matter as we were doing before using a particle uh, you know interpretation or is better to have more like a Maxwell or wave-like interpretation for this dark matter. The difference between these two regimes uh, is given by the occupation number and whether the phases of these uh, states are random or not. So in principle, if you have a galaxy, right? Uh, let's say the Milky Way, and the Milky Way has some size in space and some size in momentum, the size in space uh, in the case of the dark matter halo of the Milky Way is like 100 kiloparsec, and the size if momentum is given by the mass of the dark matter candidate and the maximum velocity that is realized in this structure, right? And in this case, it happens to be also very close to 10 to the minus 3 the speed of light. So you have, with this picture, you, what I want to tell you is that a galaxy in phase space is a fixed volume. Um, it has a fixed volume. So you, you, you take into account how many that the phase space is quantized. So there is a maximum number of states right, that you can use to start building the whole mass of the galaxy. Right? So with these two numbers here, like the size of the 100 kiloparsec and the escape velocity, this one, you can compute how many states there are in the phase space of the Milky Way. Right? And this is the solution. So there are many states. But then you have to start occupying them to explain the mass of the halo of the Milky Way. So you take the mass of the dark matter halo and divide by number of states multiplying the mass. This gives you a rough idea of the typical occupation number of each of these states. Right? It's clear. So the total mass divided by the number of states multiplying the mass is the occupation number. And if this is bigger or smaller than one, then the particle or wave, um, well, not interpretation, but the formalism for how to describe this dark matter may be more or less appropriate. Also because in principle, the phases of all these particles, in principle, if they don't interact too much, they are not correlated. So if you have something with high occupation numbers, which is gonna be the case for masses below EV, and the phases are not correlated, then you can better describe your dark matter as a collection of classical waves, satisfying some uh, classical equations. And in this case, the simplest possibility is a scalar with a certain mass. Now, in principle, if you want to know what is the distribution of this scalar in the Milky Way, you can run simulations or you can just take some uh, knowledge from what you know from the standard uh, visualization processes of dark matter. And you can say, well, the configuration of this field in the Milky Way is going to be given by a collection of waves. So here, well, instead of momentum, I use velocity to a certain maximum velocity. A Maxwellian, yes, as a first approximation, right? 
And here, the free solution. So this is uh, the frequency multiplying time, and here is some momentum multiplying space and some random phases. So this is, as I said, this is because you are describing this as a collection of waves. And here is where the magic happens because these waves are non-relativistic, and this is because you know that the typical velocity is small as compared to the speed of light. The frequency of most of these modes is the same, right? So the frequency, you take here the dispersion relation of these three waves, all of them share at first order, right? The same mass, and then they are different by some very small factor. Meaning that if you see this uh, distribution of particles and you start looking at it at a particular, sorry, at a particular time, what they do is all of them oscillate coherently up and down, up and down, up and down. And it's only when you wait for many periods that the different waves, right, they start to behave differently. What I just said, you can simulate it easily. So you can just take this distribution and evaluate it at some at one random place. And what this field wants to do is to oscillate up and down, up and down. And the amplitude is modulated, that's true. But this modulation, it happens in time scales that are very large. And this is because the distribution is very cold. So if you want, at some point, the different waves, they oscillate with different frequencies. Right? And then you start modulating the signal. But what is this time scale? This time scale for depends on the mass and the coldness of the medium. And for these small masses, typical velocity is eight months. Meaning that if I am in my lab and I am coupled to this scalar field, whatever uh, couples to it, you know, is going to experience uh, oscillations which are coherent for eight months. Now coming back to the Lagrangian, so I had some uh, effective operators here, some couplings. And uh, what I'm saying now is that these couplings may be oscillating up and down, right? Depending on what they are. And you can now try to look for those also with the previous setups. This kind of um, strategy to look for actions with uh, atomic clocks had already been, had been developed already before us. So that was the, you want, the way in which people were looking for actions in atomic clocks was, or dilatons indeed, by saying, well, whatever couples to this field, let, let me now imagine that this coupling is a coupling of this form, is gonna change what I call fundamental uh, constant, right? In the case, the mass, what I would call the mass of the electron is gonna be modulated by, by this um, independent background. So people have already looked at these things. Uh, what we have done is to extend it to more interactions and also make the matching with the previous calculation. So you want, uh, this is what, what happens that you have now your- But your again, atomic. again, yeah. Diego, go back. Yeah. This G file correction you are putting, Yeah. in general, if the ultimate scale is large, you know, that led to these contact interactions, yes. should go like, um, the G itself, like the mass of the electron, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, if you want... So both I, terms I, I, go I, like I, the mass. It's a correction, but both terms go like the mass. I agree. The I agree. Okay. Here I put it I put it like this, just... Uh, I renormalize it, if you want to call it G, but as you say, yeah, this would be a correction to the message. Okay. I think I took it directly from this paper, but uh, when yeah. you say it's correct, but I could, in principle, to see the correction, multi I mean, extract the mass and then Call this one plus something. I don't think that is as you could. It's, I think it's that you should, but okay, we can okay. later. Can you know, otherwise, one is doing something wrong. Okay. But okay. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Then what I'm saying is that now during this Ramsey process, like, so if you follow my arrow, then this atom is experiencing a different you know, background, and that changes the P2 and this is something you can measure. Right. Same for the, same for the, as long as these changes are state dependent as before, this is something you can measure. All right, so now let me give you some examples of when these devices can uh, be relevant. So the important uh, phase space is gonna be 
sorry, landscape for dark matter is going to be low masses for two reasons. First, because at low masses you have higher fluxes. Uh, second, because at low masses you have less stringent bounds. Right? So whatever I said, can, you, can, you can extrapolate to high masses, but then you cannot beat uh, ordinary detections. For actions, I told you that you cannot go to the scattering, uh, well, the, the scattering uh, strategy that I told you at the beginning about is not very efficient, and it's because this coupling at, at momentum transfer zero punishes the, the matrix element. But you can still use this idea of oscillating background. So you can go to very light masses and try to constrain the coupling, you know, this, this fundamental scale. And what atomic clocks can do is in blue, so the clocks can do quite well. What magnetometers can do is in green, much better. And you see this difference is exactly the difference that you, I, I showed you before, and this is because magnetometers are better for absolute determinations of phase shifts. This here is the standard bound that you get from astrophysics. Right? So it's indirect detection. And this here is another bound from direct detection. So in principle, you want to compare apples with apples, you have to compare these two lines. So you can do, you can do very well. This is something that had already been discussed before us by in this paper. We put some, I mean, we'd make some extra connection to you know, other uh, interactions. And quite uh, nicely, there was, Done. I mean, the data analysis was done with proper magnetometer data by this team, and you have to compare to compare these two numbers. Basically, this is the line which is green in in my plot here from our paper, and you say that of course uh, I, here I, I was putting theories bounds when you put real data in, you hit it somehow at some masses, but you know if you really want to go that deep, you need to do other experiments. These guys, what they did, they took existing data, which is quite important. They didn't, I mean, all these bounds don't require, I mean, just to give the numbers, don't require new development. They require that you run the setups in a particular case. For the case of 10 to the minus 15, this is indeed already achieved. Um, in principle, you can go to lower masses with extra or future co-magnetometers. This is totally, this is new from our paper. Uh, we just wanted to show that some models of higher masses, right? Still in this ultralight case, but that had not been considered before, also generate some effects that co-magnetometers can uh, detect and clocks also, but with the worst precision. And here there is also an effective interaction between the spin of the nucleons and some uh, momentum is one of a complex scalar dark matter. This candidate then, of oh, sorry, you may need to embed it in a, in a more complex uh, cosmology, but our point was mostly to, to show that as compared to previous bounds, these devices can really win a lot of uh, sensitivity. If you want to push it, you can push it and go to ultra, well, what I would say to high mass to the high mass regime. So to the mass where the dark matter is around kilo electron volt or even higher. Now the cross sections that we could constrain are quite impressive with magnetometer and with clocks for a particular model, which is not very impressive, okay? That, that's to be fair. So we assume that if there is a fraction of the total dark matter, like, uh, like this 0 0.05 amount of it, that interacts with the spin of the nucleons through a ultralight, I'm sorry, through a quite light mediator, and this mediator has to be quite light. In this case, again, these devices, the, as compared to previous bounds, can constrain super tiny cross sections. And this is, well, in this case, the trick is given by the fact that this mass is so small that, you know, you are, the amount of dark matter interacting eventually with your device is huge. So the flux that you accumulate uh, in this interaction is very big, all right? As I said, this model uh, is not the favorite model of anyone, I think, but this was just the beginning. So we hopefully will find better models in the, in the future. And let me just finish, sorry, if I overrun a bit. 
Because the main conclusion is that uh, these precise quantum devices are there and they are being built for other purposes. The main purpose is precision, but this precision is spoiled by a huge flux of small momentum if this happens coherently. Of course, as Juan said, if this is not, I mean, if all of these scatterings is independent to each other, eventually they will, you know, and there will be, uh, this effect will be uh, smaller, but in principle, some interactions are not, are also uh, coherent. Those are standard. There are new possibilities to explore. This is a jump field, quantum physics for fundamental physics. There are new uh, uh, initiatives by CERN, by the US and by the UK, by Europe in general, trying to push this field. And I really invite you to, well, if you're interested to, to talk to us because typically, you know, it's, it's quite not fun, the kind of physics that, that, that you learn. And in particular for the future, and I'm, I'm gonna stop here. Just let me tell you a couple of things. One is the neutrinos. Of course, the neutrino, if you have a neutrino flux, which is polarized, uh, you may try to detect it with these guys. The cosmic neutrino background in principle is not polarized, but you can also put numbers in. And we are some, I mean, we're far away to detect it in common atometers today, but still, you know, who knows what the future will bring. So another interesting th thought that uh, we had is what happens if you have a huge flux generated in reactors or in, you know, in a, in a collider, things like, uh, I mean, it's kind of a huge fluxes of very um, weakly interacting particles are being looked for now with the, some new devices at, um, at LHC. So why not trying to, I mean, to think what happens if you put an atomic clock, you know, close to a beam, beam dump, right? This is something we, I have no idea what's gonna happen, but I think it's quite often interesting. So I'm gonna stop here, so thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, clap, 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 clap. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> are you honest, let's... Can we ask questions? Yes, please. Well, I don't know, I ask us the... Yeah, I don't know where he is, the moderator. Chairman, yeah, yeah. I can, I can chair myself, so yeah. Please. Okay, so... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't, I forgot to unmute myself, so I broke oh. my own rules. So do we raise hands, so how does this go? Uh, just uh, chaotically, okay. it usually works okay. So, um, I had uh, two questions. Well, I had one which was the one related to the CERN thing, so that you mentioned. But if this green area, that was your area, so I'm going back to this thing you said that if I have um, background coherent oscillating fields, so it can also, also be good for action like particles, etc. right? Yeah. And you said that other people have done that this green band is not only you, it's magnetometer or other people, etc. Um, do you mind if I ask you what is the part which is, where did you advance something different in this uh, very interesting area? Quantitatively or in range or whatever? Okay, for, for the axionic case, uh, what we did, we added the, well, we, we didn't know what the clocks uh we're gonna do yeah if they are they are worse than the magnetometers so this this is green is magnetometers yeah and those are overestimates but these estimates were already given by graha metal in this paper we didn't know we were kind of scooped okay. <laughs> but what we added also in this in this regime is we computed the the form factors we, they didn't compute the form factors or anything mm -hmm. they just give the estimate so since here on the left, you see that this is the coupling to the nucleon. Yes. You really want to connect it to the fundamental coupling to quarks or whatever, you need to do more, more work. So we really connect it to the nucleon, sorry, to the form factors of the, of the atom. So we put the rubidium, sorry, not the rubidium, the, the helium that you use in common atometer. So it was a bit more of, uh, a bit more of, this, uh, of this physics. Uh, as I said, uh, 
for this case, and for, we added more for the for the cousin, for the cousin of the action that matter, which is the axial vector. You put an axial vector, then yes, I didn't. I, I have it somewhere. Let me show you. This is this is new. Yeah, this is the axial vector. Okay. And these are well. This is the same kind of. Uh, and then we yeah we. I mean, it's not very difficult, but we 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 included this new new bound. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will wait it. Can you go to the summary? The second question. Very. This looks summary? very. Yes. Okay. There, 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 there. Can you say a bit more, or is uh, about yeah. atom interferometry the less thing? Ah, well, here, what I'm doing uh, in simple words is I am taking the atomic clock. Uh, other people had used the atomic clock as a ultra precise device that gives me a standard of time, for instance, and then try to compare with other standard of time. What we have done it in this work, we really went to the inside of the clock and use it as an interferometer. So two states that are interfering, right? And see that if these two states are interacting through different couplings, while I mean before they interfere, mm -hmm. right? They by then when you make them interfere, you may be able to detect a phase shift. So we are not doing nothing but some atom interferometry, right? Uh, and that's what atomic clocks do if you want. Now, atomic clocks are not the only interferometers, right? In particular, you can do light interferometry, you can do atom interferometry for different things. And one of the questions that still is I mean, that we want to, to investigate is what these other atom interferometers do when dark matter goes through them, right? In this case, these two, this interferometry happened, you know, in my case, for instance, happened between two states of different spin. But for instance, if the, these two states in the interferometer, they have different momentum, it's, it's enough. then you may be able to detect other, other, other interactions. Or if the two states are not atom interferometers, but light interferometers. So let's take uh, let's take LIGO, mm -hmm. and imagine that each beam is polarized. Okay. Right, and then when they interfere, if they interfere with dark matter, and this they may uh, they may acquire a different phase, and then when they interfere, you may also be sensitive to this kind of couplings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Diego, my comment about randomicity uh, due to different directions would apply to the neutrino background, right? It's not Absolutely. just that you have a very low uh, amplitude or a very tiny interaction with, with those atoms, but also because they, they are coming from all directions. And this brings me to, to the question. That was a comment. Uh, it is true that recent um, reanalysis of how dark matter is distributing around our galaxy seems to depend a lot on the history. That means on the merger tree history, how did our galaxy really get assembled out of pockets of dark matter of smaller masses which interact and merged into our galaxy? A recent analysis, for instance, this recent paper by Carlos Frank, suggests that actual a halo of our galaxy is very far from spherical, as you were assuming, and it has a very twisted uh, nature. So somehow, a, dark matter is, is moving in, in, in streams, and it, it's certainly very far from, from spherical. It may happen that we leave, we move, our Earth, or the Sun, is moving inside one of those streams, and therefore, a interaction would be coherent. But yeah. it is also possible that we might be in, in some other place where uh, there is a different directions, different streams, yeah. if you want, okay? Yeah. This is more and more. Uh, can you have can you have scale now. on the scale of the Earth? Excuse me. On Not on the scale of the Earth. Earth. No, on the scale of parsecs. So on yeah. the scale Tens of the Earth, parsecs. the flux should be more or less uniform. No? I don't know. Pointing in a random direction, but uniform. Mm -hmm. You, you yeah, see, what fraction is in one direction, one yeah. fraction is another. You may be living in an under dense region or with different with different momentum distribution. That's true. Different momentum distribution. It's true. It's still coherent in that, no? Yeah, but the, uh, in principle, what I use here is that the, the Earth, 
it's already there, yeah. The, the sun is moving with a preferred direction with respect to the rest frame of the dark matter, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the standard assumption. Yeah, if yeah, that's we are, that I'm challenging. Yeah, well, this is a challenge for all dark matter experiments. Indeed. Uh, in, pr in principle. Uh, I think that this is, we cannot just hope that, uh, you know, this plays in our favor, if you want. <laughs> In the sense that if it goes, if it happens that we live in an under dense region for some reason, then of course the bounds are, are going to be, have to be revisited. But uh, I, I don't have anything to comment apart from this. Like, uh, uh, I think all, all, all the, whenever you compute a cross uh, sorry, uh, exclusion plot, you put in the, some assumptions about the distribution, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And I, I'm putting in the standard ones. Well, I mean, in the future, maybe not today with the data is not fine enough, but in the future, uh, astrometry like uh, we begin to do with Gaia will allow us to know not just when did previous streams uh, interact with our galaxy, but actually how do the stars around us move mm. and therefore deduce from there the, the amount of dark matter. For the moment, this is, is too early. You yeah. have to wait for years. Yeah. But it, if there's a chance we might have access to that information. Yeah, I think that for now, before there is a detection of dark matter in the lab, it's going to be, I mean, everyone in the community, well, some people also change this 0.3 GB per centimeter cube. They, there are yeah. some models where this is 0.6. Mm -hmm. uh, all these other one factors, as you can imagine, I didn't really consider them when I, use, when I do these theories plots, right? Here, I just put the vanilla, the vanilla density. Yeah. It can vary up and down order of magnitude. Okay. It can vary up and down order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Sure. More questions? So. Yes. I think you're muted, Belen. What are the experimental groups which are leading this search? Which I mean, ones? Where, where, where can we expect and when more sensitive? Guys, the, the magnetometers? Yes. Okay. So the magnetometers, uh, let me show you the plot of the uh, yeah. real data. So this data, uh, in principle, the best co-magnetometer, you need to have a co-magnetometer, mm. are uh, so there are two main groups. One is in Princeton. Uh, the leader is a, well, a person called Romalis. And they have been trying to use these magnetometers to measure uh, anomalous couplings to the spin of particles. These anomalous couplings, you can, for instance, when you have a co-magnetometer, you can also try to look for spin-spin uh, interactions, for instance. You can try to look for of course, the yeah. Earth itself is polarized a little bit. So if there is a fifth force which is spin dependent and you have a magnetometer, you can try to look for this kind of uh, situations or you can try to look for a preferred frame in the universe that is coupled to spin. So these groups in Princeton, Romali's group, he has already analyzed this, this kind of uh, situation. There is another group in Germany, uh, in the UK, we have uh, submitted a proposal uh, to, to, the, to a call, okay, which is, I don't think, well, now with this whole situation, most likely it's not going to be funded. But, <laughs> but uh, there is also the possibility to, to do more dedicated device, I mean, devices dedicated to the dark matter searches. No one is building now magnetometers, which have the specifications which are preferred for dark matter searches, as far as I know. For instance, if I have something more compact, as I told you, or that operates uh, faster, I can win. Yeah, I didn't tell you why I put a bar here. This bar, this bar here that you see, this 10 to the minus 15 cut is more or less the second, right? And the, you lose sensitivity at the second because your device operates in the second, at second, right? You, when, you, when you measure this uh, difference in the, in the lines, of the clocks, or when you measure the the, um, the magnetic fields 
to the Tesla level. The second is the scale that you use, you know, to get your sensitivities. But in principle, if you can be faster, even if you lose sensitivity, you may extend these plots to higher masses. Mm -hmm. So that's something that in principle, experimentalists may be convinced to do if there is still some budget in the next year for the for science. And I and I, prom I promise last question. Um, how do they control that there are no fluctuations or inhomogeneities in the in the magnetic field itself? They do it, can they use you know a magnetometer which is a gas and then you understand what I mean? What I yeah, mean? They, they need to okay. Go back to here. So what, what you what you want to measure is the well, of course this formula. Of the, you can have fake effects, you know. You can have, of course, the, the if you go to this, this paper is an experimental paper, all right, mm -hmm. where they give you the noise on these uh, Larmor frequencies, right? And they have already, that's very interesting, that they have already used the magnetometer to look for anomalous couplings. So, in, in a way you can use the results directly because they have taken into account they have taken into account different systematics of the gradients in the field the fact that uh, you know the field may fluctuate in time mm -hmm. the key word is really called magnetometer all this with a single magnetometer is impossible to do so you need to put in the same volume uh, some sample with helium and other elements that okay. both of them measure the magnetic field and the dark matter effect, but with different couplings. So if the dark matter couples mm -hmm. exactly as uh, electromagnetism couples, you cannot see anything, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, I understand. So it's just precisely that. Okay, yeah. thanks. Any more questions for Diego? Diego? In the yes. plot of the bounds that you were showing right now, uh, there's some astrophysical horizontal line. Yeah, it's, it's not really. Examples. Yeah, it's not really related to what you've done. But where does this come from? Well, this is from supernova cooling, or from yeah, I think here they are or neutron star uh, cooling. You know these kind of things. The thing is that in principle, if you have extra extra particles living in a in a super in a yes. star environment right they they help to the extraction of energy so they cool them more efficiently and that means that the mean the lifetime of these guys are higher or lower okay. or where the supernova explodes the same no the if you transport energy more efficiently because there is new channels of transfer then the standard supernova uh, cooling happens faster uh, yeah, uh, this is tricky mm -hmm. always because well, yeah. and indeed in this discipline is very easy to get because this is G Fermi <laughs> in certain units. So whatever is if you can produce something more efficiently than neutrinos, then typically you can cool faster than the standard model, right? So you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And are there any other proposals in this mass range that you know of? Oh yeah, for, for this. Yes. Well, uh, for the spin-dependent couplings, there is something called Casper, which is yeah, yeah. It's not yet that. I wonder if it is here. Ah, here, here there is. You know, when you saw these lines. This is data already from some yes. time ago, so it may it may reach better values. Uh, for the this is the coupling to nucleons, right? So for yeah. the coupling to nucleons. Uh, you know, the proposals are basically these ones. Mm -hmm. For the coupling to photons, which in principle, if you have a UV model, they are related, then there are many, many, I don't know. Every week there is a new one, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So can you, can you tell the difference between fuzzy dark matter and standard actions with this uh, type of measurement? Well, a standard action, I don't think I have the action, the real, you know, if you go to ordinary I mean, I mean, action, what, uh, I mean uh, if you imagine that you are doing a scattering in a background field, or you are doing a scattering in a background Bose condensate, 
Classical right. field or Bose condensate. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, in principle, uh, okay, yeah, sorry. Let me go back to this picture. So this picture here is true for when you have many waves, these waves, okay, this is, you know, this is the, just the wave here, no? This is Px, this is omega t. Uh, there is some distribution and there is some phase, there are some phases. So how, how do you generate dark matter halos from this original dark matter? In principle, these wave packets that were generated by some misalignment process in the early universe or whatever, they start to, to co co cool down and at some point different packets start forming halos and they are not relaxed to the lower state. So in principle, their phases here are uncorrelated. This is, I think, is the standard case. If you start adding self-interaction between the these guys, you may cool down and generate a condensate. But to me, a condensate is when these guys here have, uh, you know, are correlated. Otherwise, this is just a, a non-coherent amount of uh, of waves with a certain density. Now, what I said is true if you also for the coherent case, right? If these phases are not random, then this effect is true. If you start seeing other, if you start seeing something beyond, beyond the, the common uh, up and down, you start seeing what happens with this, with this uh, distribution. So you start seeing how this signal is modulated, then you indeed, you may, you may find that the phases are not random. This, what I mean. this is a plot that uh, these guys did by uh, making a chunk of uh, different momentum. You assign a random phase to it, and then you see what happens as time evolves. If this is not random, then you're not going to see this shape. But you have to wait to start seeing what the distribution is. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense what I'm saying? OK. But in principle, this, as I say, in principle, uh, in these actions, in these ultra light, light, light dark matter cases, there is no, I mean, there are two different schools. If you want. Some people believe that they have condensed, right? That these phases are not random. I, I honestly don't think this happens uh, generically. In principle, these waves have generated a Realized halo, um, the time, the, the what is the name, the relaxation time to really cool down to a to a condensate is huge. You can compute it. There were some papers by the Valley, other papers by Herzberg, where you know if you don't have strong self interaction of these guys, well, it takes a really really long time to 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 condensate just by you want gravitational relaxation. Mm -hmm. Oh, but that's an interesting question. What happens when, when phases are correlated? Okay, any more questions for Diego? No? If not, uh, let's thank Diego for this very nice talk again. I, I will give you again the, the clapping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you, Diego. So, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, I hope to visit you soon. All right. Hope so. I hope to visit my family soon too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, see you next week. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bueno, Diego, bye bye. Ha salido muy bien. Eh? Sí, Ay, voy a quitar el, voy a parar el recording. <laughs>